Why do we do the things we do? Why are we drawn to certain activities and behaviors? In this tricky topic, we're going to dive into the muddy waters of motivation. Studying motivation is essentially exploring what individuals want. When faced with making a decision, our wants have a huge voice in what we actually decide to do. We make hundreds of little decisions every day, possibly thousands. Some of these are deliberate and take years, like choosing what kind of career to pursue, while others are more spontaneous and unplanned, like the kinds and amounts of food we choose to eat. Motivation is defined as wants or needs that direct behavior towards a goal. There are a couple of terms that are used to describe different aspects of motivation, which will be useful in comparing theories. A need is commonly defined as a biological state of deficiency that triggers drives. A drive itself is a subjectively perceived state of tension that occurs when deficient in something. Therefore, drives are need-specific. An incentive is any object or event that motivates behavior. This is another word for a reinforcer, or something that increases the likelihood of a behavior happening. An incentive can trigger motivated behavior without true biological need. Whereas drives push behavior, incentives pull behavior, and so there are both internal and external forces that can feed into motivation. Wanting is sometimes congruent with our needs, but not always. Let's consider some examples. Some needs are obvious and universal, like the need for food. We need energy and nutrients, certainly we can't live without them, so the drive of hunger prompts a motivated behavior, in this case eating. This trio of need-drive behavior is seen in all animals, and, in fact, the biological processes that trigger and control hunger are very similar in humans, rats, and mice. The need for water is also easily understood in terms of biological deficiency. Thirst becomes overwhelming if we get severely dehydrated, so it promotes drinking behavior. However, all motivated behaviors don't fit as neatly into this tidy framework. Take knowledge, for instance. Clearly, we humans go to great efforts to acquire knowledge and understand what's going on around us. Curiosity is a strong motivator in other animals as well, and it drives exploration. But, does this fit the definition of a need? You won't necessarily die from lack of knowledge, so it's not as critical to survival as food or water. We'll review several different theories of motivation and consider how well they explain these different types of goal-directed behavior. One of the earliest thinkers to weigh in on motivation was William James, who is considered to be the father of American psychology. He hypothesized that behaviors are driven by different instincts that help us survive. Instincts are defined as unlearned behaviors shared by members of a species. Some instincts, like feeding, are obvious and common amongst all animals. Other unlearned behaviors, described by James, such as a baby seeking out a nipple for milk, are also related to survival, as is the mother's instinct to protect the child. However, hunting prey was also considered by some to be an unlearned human instinct, and there was a lot of disagreement between researchers on what behaviors should be included. Furthermore, emerging evidence showed that learning could have a powerful effect on motivated behavior, and instinct theory could not account for this. James was strongly influenced by Charles Darwin's theory of evolution through natural selection. At the core of this is the idea that the purpose of any living organism is to perpetuate itself. You've likely heard the phrase, survival of the fittest, which is the cornerstone of Darwin's theory of natural selection. From this perspective, fitness refers to the ability to survive and reproduce. Basic needs, such as food, fluids, and optimal temperature, are often explained from this perspective. If we become deficient in some need, drives can redirect our behavior towards goals that can keep us alive. Given that certain motivated behaviors are shared by all animals, the evolutionary model suggests that they were naturally selected for in our early ancestors because they promoted fitness. So it's easy to appreciate how James was swayed by Darwin's theories at the time. 
Another prominent theory related to the evolutionary model is the drive reduction model. It extends the evolutionary model and adds explanation about the mechanism of motivation. It states that behavior is driven by the need to balance physiological systems when depleted and is closely tied to the idea of homeostasis, the tendency to maintain balance in biological systems. According to drive theory, homeostasis sets up equilibrium around an optimal set point or fixed setting of a particular physiological system. The drive reduction model of motivation is based on the body's tendency to maintain homeostasis, so we'll consider temperature. This model suggests that there are sensory detectors that monitor the current state, which is compared to the body's set point. For temperature in humans, this is about 37 degrees Celsius. If it's too hot, then the body kicks in various cooling responses, such as sweating, or behaviors like removing clothing or relocating to a cooler place. If it's too cold, then the body activates heating responses, such as shivering or motivated behaviors such as adding a layer of clothing. This perspective is obviously dependent on set points, and we know the set point for body temperature in humans. But what about other strong drives such as hunger? What is the set point for food? We require many different types of nutrients, but there don't appear to be simple set points for sugars and fats in the same way there is for temperature, so the drive reduction model can't fully explain how hunger and feeding work. Another issue with this model is that some strong drives, like sex drive, don't appear to be driven by physiological set points at all. The optimal arousal model of motivation argues that humans are motivated to be in situations that are neither too stimulating nor not stimulating enough. Sort of the Goldilocks principle, not too boring, not too stimulating, but just right. Support for this model comes from observations of people in the 1950s who volunteered to undergo sensory deprivation, usually achieved by having them spend long periods of time in a sensory deprivation or isolation tank. Most volunteers could not remain in sensory deprivation for more than two or three days, even if they were paid double. Long-term deprivation led to a pathology of boredom and sometimes resulted in hallucinations and cognitive impairment. The interpretation from these findings was that the brain will create stimulation if it's lacking and is the foundation of the optimal arousal model. The yerkes dodson law is not strictly related to motivation, but it uses the idea of optimal arousal to explain effects on performance. This law states that moderate levels of arousal lead to optimal performance. At low levels of arousal, such as during boredom or apathy, people show very poor or even no performance on a given task. At high levels of arousal, such as with states of panic, people's task performance on just about anything is quite bad. There's a sweet spot in the middle where just the right amount of alertness leads to the best task performance. Yerkes and Dodson also found in their experiments that optimal arousal effects differ with task difficulty. More difficult tasks, such as shown in blue, shift the curve to the left, meaning levels of anxiety are particularly damaging for novices. Yerkes and Dodson's research was done over 100 years ago in mice, and although there has been some support from human studies, this phenomenon is not really a law. Another criticism is that performance is not equal to motivation, but motivation and performance often go hand in hand. Think back to the last time you wrote an important exam. Finally, we come to Abraham Maslow's hierarchical model of motivation, which attempts to explain basic biological needs, such as food and safety, as well as needs not directly tied to survival, such as personal achievement. Maslow's model organizes all of these diverse needs into a hierarchy according to priority arranged in this pyramid. At the bottom are physiological needs, such as the need for food, water, and adequate body temperature. On the next level are security needs, which include the needs for physical security, stability, and safety from threats. Next are social needs, including the desire for family, friendship, and belonging to a social group. The fourth level in Maslow's hierarchy of needs is the need for esteem, the need to appreciate oneself and one's worth. And at the top of the pyramid is self-actualization, the full realization of one's potential. 
This model is useful in that it gives organization to a diverse collection of motivated behaviors. It suggests that basic needs must first be met before progressing up the hierarchy. However, this model doesn't have a lot of scientific support. Critics of Maslow's model point out that belongingness in social species, such as humans, is critical for many physiological needs, and therefore this hierarchy might not be accurate. However, Maslow's pyramid attempts to explain motivation based both on needs at the bottom and wants at the top. So there you have it, a messy, complicated, but hopefully interesting introduction to the psychology of motivation.